Welcome to the Game Room. This episode, we're talking about Runaway Hirelings, an improv-heavy fantasy RPG from Thomas Nopisel. Before we start, though, we do need to acknowledge that Thomas provided us with a review copy of the print version of Runaway Hirelings. All right, so Runaway Hirelings is designed and written by Thomas A. Novacell. He did have some help from Jarrett Crater and Owen Kerr. It features art by Thomas A. Novacell himself. Runaway Hirelings started as a one-page RPG, which was released in 2016. A revised edition was written and released in 2018. This review is of the longer revised edition. Now, you can get Runaway Hirelings as either a PDF or a softcover book. Uh, this review is in regards to the physical book version. There's not really anything to unbox or show off here, so there's no unboxing for me to point you to for this review. Yeah, they have Runaway Hirelings. The copy I have is a thin digest size book. Uh, clocks in at 42 pages, but interestingly is only 33 pages long. Uh, the back don't have anything on them. I have to assume this is something to do with drive through RPGs print on demand service where they have to print at at least 42 pages. So there is a little bit of bill and blanky spot to draw and add some character notes in the back of the book. Uh, the book is black and white, uses a single column layout and some text that's just a little smaller than I would have liked. There is a surprisingly high amount of artwork in this book. Like flipping through the book, I would say that it's more than half art, which is kind of cool. The art style is unique and slightly humorous and I dig it. While there are no chapters in the book, it is broken up into a number of sections. So how about you quickly go through what we will find in Runaway Hirelings? All right, so the first thing introduces you to the game, and it does this by diving right in. So this is a, an RPG book or a game written for experienced players and game masters. You're not going to find anything here explaining what, uh, how, what 1D6 means or what different types are or what role-playing is. Instead, Thomas wastes no time and just dives into what the game's all about. And the core of this gameplay is explained, followed by a list of what's needed to play, which isn't much. All you need is a character sheet for each hireling, possibly two, some pencils, some scrap paper, and a couple six-sided dice. Like 2d6 should do you. Now, in this game, you're creating a dungeon as you go. This is done by a number of different rules, which are basically set up like moves in any Powered by the Apocalypse game. The basic flow is that one player is going to give the name of the room, Another player is going to point out a problem that can be sensed in the room. Then the game's master, called a Dunark here, which is short for Dungeon Architect, will use those two prompts from the two other different players to describe the room, to come up with it. So then they're going to roll a D6 and determine a danger score. And then the players, the halflings, halflings, sorry, hirelings, are going to take actions to try to find the exit of this room and the entrance to the next room. When players have gotten past a number of threats equal to the danger score, the next room's revealed. These actions are repeated until you get to the final room, which follows the same rules with higher stakes. Now, one thing you have to know in this game is that you are not adventurers. You are not heroes. You are not, you're basically not competent. Unlike many games that are about competence porn, this is the opposite. You are playing hirelings. Hirelings that don't have much skill, but more about that in a bit. Note that uh, just in case it comes up again, we yes. have been saying the word halflings in place of hirelings since this game arrived at yes. the bellhop's table in the very first time. So there are no halflings in this game. So please just understand that if you hear the word <laughs> halfling, we mean hireling. To be honest, I just realized we have an unboxing video of this. Because this is a surprise package I opened up. We actually do have an unboxing video of this. So you can see the art in Runaway Hirelings. If you head over to YouTube and search for Runaway Hirelings Tabletop Bellhop. And if I remember correctly, like Thomas even linked it on his site. But I was just thinking RPG book. We don't do unboxings for most RPG books. But yeah, I think we have one. Where I called the game Runaway Hi Halflings the entire time. Because <laughs> I read the cover along. And I got to admit that cover art could be a halfling. And that's another note, too, is, is uh, we haven't really gotten into character generation, but there are no races specified. You could be halflings. That's it. Just in my head, I just pretend they're always halflings, and we're all good. So as for uh, the next section is the rules of play, and these are broken down in a series of triggers and what to do when those happen. Again, this is like a Powered by the Apocalypse thing, where it's like when entering a room, do this. When a character helps another, do this. Uh, there are moves for discovery and finding new rooms, rules uh, for helping each other, doing stuff, rules for gold, hireling creation, and of course, hireling death. 
Now, I don't want to get into too much detail here on the podcast. You can read all that on the blog. But what I would want to do is highlight a couple of rules that really stick out to me and that are, that are important to this game in this setting. The first is the fact you are just hirelings. You are not adventurers. Each character type in the game is good at one thing and one thing only. And that one thing isn't always that useful. Like the slop cook can cook, the torchbearer can find things in the dark, and the peasant is pretty much good at not being noticed, and that's about it. None of these are actually good at doing adventuring style things, like, say, fighting or casting spells. And this really is where you get into the meat of the entire concept. Unlike most games where you can and should assume that competence uh, is, is a basic level for all your <laughs> characters, this is most assuredly not the case here. In fact, the opposite is true. You're here because you were needed to carry stuff for the mm. real adventurers, but now you're on your own. Now, as for making these characters, you got a dead simple character creation system. I almost didn't want to cover it here, but some of this stuff here is important to understand the other stuff. There's seven different types in the book. You grab a sheet. Again, think Powered by the Apocalypse. Grab your um, archetype. I can't remember what they're called. Your playbook. But it's just one sheet. Uh, give your character a name. Pick a build question. So there's a few questions to answer. Give you some background. Pick one piece of equipment off the equipment list. Note none of this equipment's actually useful. And then note down that you have 15 gold. And gold is basically your health in this game. When you run out of gold, that's when your character expires. Well, silly, you can assume that these hirelings were desperate for funds, which is how they got into this position in the first place. So without anything to return home with, they'd rather not carry on. Yeah, I, do, I gotta admit, when we played, it didn't really come up, but I gotta admit, the use of gold is a little weird. I heard another actual play podcast where they kept talking about, like, when the monsters attacked, they would cut their purse, and they drop a few coins, and I'm like, I just ignored it. To me, it was an abstract, just as much as hit points are in Dungeons & Dragons. Now, the rules for doing stuff, that's your important thing, right? This is your, how do you know if you succeed or fail at something, is all about if the hireling that's acting is doing what they're good at or not. And it's going to take clever play and out-of-the-box thinking by the players to actually get these near-useless half hirelings, Jesus, to come up with narrative reasons their skills can apply and actually be useful in each situation. What is wrong with me and hirelings and halflings? I apologize, That's Tom, why you, I put the note in there. <laughs> you, you, need, you need to write a follow-up called Runaway Hirelings, and uh, I don't know, the, the hairy foot move for if you want to move fleet of foot. Anyway, sorry. In general... If a hireling is doing what they're good at, if, if the players can come up with a reason that the slop cooks stew from yesterday is a way to get past the obstacle, they succeed. All they have to do is tell a story. Now, there are four different types of stories that are listed in the book, and the Darn Art picks one of those. Uh, uh, the actual how they work, again, isn't important here. And then they do what they set out to do. But after the first four successes, each, each of the four story types is used, they success starts coming at a cost. And this is a, an economy in the game of flail points where you're going to earn and spend flail points in yes. order to succeed. And see, the, for me, this was the first little hiccup in the game I found because I felt that flail points weren't actually as easy to come by as they maybe should have. So after those first four actions are taken, you, you can't try and succeed in this mm -hmm. method. Um, unless you happen to have gotten a flail point along the way. Yeah. yeah, that's a big part of the game. And I don't know if if we didn't run it properly or if just the game's supposed to be brutal, that you're not supposed to get a lot of flail points and you're supposed to fail because that does come up with a, a rule where you can flail to flail. Or I, I again, it's, I'm not even saying hireling or halfling this time, but fail to flail where you choose an action where you should have succeeded, choose to fail, but you get a flail point. And I think that's supposed to be part of the comedy of the game. Plus, the neat mechanic and the fun part actually does come up with the next part, which is doing something that isn't your thing at all, which has the players describe what they're doing and then rolling a d6. And it's only on a five or six. On a five or six, despite all logic, your hirelings manage to succeed, and they get a bonus of asking the Dunark a question, which can give them some more information on the next scene. But with a four or less, disaster occurs. Each of the other players is going to describe how they think things went wrong, one of the possibilities of how things went wrong, and then the group decides on the best outcome of those. Now, failure comes with a significant loss of gold. Now, well, again, gold is health, so this is probably how you're going to lose characters. So the, the holding the table for how they die is very penny for your thoughts, like which I like. Now, alternatively, again, going back to those flail points, is a player could spend two to succeed automatically at something they're not good at, which I don't even think that came up in our game. 
Now, this is actually where I think the game succeeds, and and, and it's where the players should uh, should get into the pocket and be playing in for the most fun, mm-hmm. right? So this this not doing, not trying to to fudge your one actual ability into every nook and cranny. No, no, just do something else and roll with the failure. And that's yeah. where the game can really sort of come into its own. I agree. Now, another thing I do want to highlight is how character decks work, because this is important. For one, it's expected. Like Sean said, you don't get enough flail points to succeed at everything. You have to fail to get to the end of the dungeon. It is going to happen. This is a game where you basically get three lives, which I keep thinking about paranoia anytime I think of a game with lives, but these aren't quite clones. After your first character perishes by losing all the gold, you make a second. This character is made basically the same as the first, but you only get 10 gold, and your build question changes. So here's a very specific one, which is, why were you left behind or forgetting, forgotten on the way in? Now, if your second character doesn't make it either, which is, again, possible, you do get one more shot. This part I thought was awesome, because you grab your first character sheet again, because they weren't actually dead. I'm not dead yet. One of their items has been changed in some way, but your original is back, but only five gold left. Right. So the mechanics required for character rebirth are interesting, especially because of the way that question, the sort of, that, that rounds out your character changes through uh, through the steps uh, and you know explains things and adds more uh, depth to the story and more fun to the game as a result now the book also contains some advice for the the gm the dun arc including how they should stock the dungeon how to determine that danger score which really is a d6 uh and that dungeon danger score is how many actions the players have to take before finding the next room note it's not successes it's actions which is an important part of the game too how to start the session and stuff which includes some world building which can be important later now the rest of the book is the seven different hireling types uh just because people will probably want to know there's the trap poker the torchbearer the peasant the chronicler the fool the itinerant monk and the slop chef each hireling gets its own page and a piece of art that goes with it. And rules for each include uh, starting equipment they have, and it's all unique. And then what each hireling special is, specialty is, and then a set of build questions, one of which is answered during character creation. So in case you haven't quite caught on yet, this is not your classic oh. RPG. No, and that was the problem when I first read this, because I got to say, I was intimidated by this. Like, this is a small book, right? I shouldn't get scared of it. I would rather read Dungeon Crawl Classics, which is 400 pages. I'm more comfortable with that because I am much, very much a traditional role-playing gamer. Like, I'm in my 40s. I have been playing RPGs since the 1980s. I am used to crunchy games with lots of rules, and more importantly to this, as far as comfort level goes, is games that require substantial preparation time before play. I'm also used to being the game master, the god, the one responsible for all the world building and the narration, and I got to come up with everything. Now, I have been playing a number of newer games in recent years that are a little more improv heavy, but this super improv heavy, like 100% improv, shared narration, like this games like Runaway Hirelings are still kind of outside my wheelhouse. This is a game that rewards not only mechanically, but in your enjoyment. Your ability to think fast and roll with the punches, both as a player and as a Dunark. If you're the type who prefers a more quiet style, rolling for your attacks and actions, and being guided along by the adventure in the book or in the mind of the GM, then this either isn't for you, or you'd better be prepared to learn a whole new (laughs) skill set. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Uh, the other thing that's a little weird, like I found this off-putting, was the way the rules are written in this book and the order. Like I recognize the format. I have played some Powered by the Apocalypse game. I own Dungeon World. I own Apocalypse World Second Edition. I've seen this before. I've seen the move format, I and I get it. But like I just had a hard time with the order they were presented and the piecing what went where. And it was just rough. Like even Thomas notes it in his notes that at the beginning it basically says these moves are presented in the order that might come up, read through them all, then read the setup rules, then go back and reread all the moves so you can see how they work together. Like, I'm just not used to having to read a book twice to figure out how all the pieces fall together. Yeah, and while certainly not how we are used to an RPG guide, it does reinforce the difference of this game, and that forced second reading could help some folks really get a hold of what it, what it is yeah. they're about to undertake. 
Now, personally, what I did, I did read it. Actually, I read it more than twice because I prepped for playing this a few times. But what I really helped it sink in, what really got me to grok it was listening to an actual play. I found one by the Technical Difficulties Gaming Podcast. They have an actual play of Runaway Hirelings. We'll throw a link in the show notes. That really made sure to tell me how things flowed because what i was missing was how everything flowed together to make it work like where the intro goes and how the turn flow is once i got that and it all slipped into place it made sense it, it and actually started playing it actually played very smoothly like there there really weren't any issues or bumps and the only things we had to look up were the actual moves not what order there weren't other parts of the rule book i had to go to because like the basic flow is you enter a room you get a couple player prompts, you then use those to create some challenges and then have the players face those challenges. And that's pretty much it, right? And then the neat part was having two different players provide prompts and then the Don Arc just taking those and going with it and just kind of letting your imagination go was pretty awesome. Like my favorite part was, uh, naming the rooms was, uh, the room was the Tomb of Exhaustion, which was this white marble tomb where in the niches, instead of having caskets or, or undead or, or skeletons or anything, had very comfortable beds and there were pillows and duvets and down pillows and all kinds of soft things to lay and rest on. And after the party took a nap, they pissed off a down golem, which to, to this day is probably going to be one of my favorite encounters in a role playing game for some time. Now, one thing about the system of dungeon generation is that the dark really needs to be even more comfortable with improv than the players. Mm. Uh, and it does seem a little bit unbalanced that way, actually, uh, for some story games. But depending on the makeup of the table, that could be better or worse. Yeah. And the rulebook did suggest you source the players whenever you're stumped. So I'd be like, oh, what do you think could be in here? Like, we could have done more of that. So... I think it's definitely more of the thing. The other thing we did not do that I totally, I don't know if we missed it in the rules, is you can spend a flail point. Again, they were short things to change facts. So someone could have said, well, that's not how I remember it. It wasn't a down golem. It was a whatever, something else, which I don't think we got into that. Yeah, no, there weren't <laughs> near enough flail points for people to do that. Yeah, for people to do that. Exactly, right? So now in the, in the game I ran, my players were a mix of traditional game fans and fans of more story-based indie-style games. And I got to say, it seemed like everyone had a great time playing. Everyone noted they were willing to play it again, but not right away. While it did seem like a fun game and a game you might break out, it's definitely a game you're just not going to play every week, a couple weeks in a row. This is a, a now-and-then game. We also all agreed that this would be a fantastic game to run or play at a game convention. Absolutely. I think because of the light, easy accessibility of it, as well as a con game, it could make a really great educational tool mm -hmm. for improvisation uh, teams or drama class. And it would be interesting. It'll be interesting. I'd like to hear from Brian, patron of the show, Brian, if, if he's when he hears this, uh, if it might be something he would use in his work with you. Mm -hmm. uh, again, just to get people talking and communicating and interacting in this freeform way. Um, though, it is also a light, easy way for groups to try out the storytelling game style without mm. needing to dive into a full Powered by the Apocalypse or Forged in the Dark system. As for me, I had a better time than I thought I would while playing it. Um, single session, fantasy dungeon crawler RPG relies heavily on the entire group's ability to improvise and think on their feet. And same as what Sean basically said, because of that, I don't know if it'll be for everyone. That, that improv level, this is a zero prep game. And if you didn't grow up playing Dungeons and Dragons and Dungeon Crawlers and watching Lord of the Rings, if you didn't have all those tropes, thankfully I grew up playing all those games and seeing all those worlds. So it was fairly easy for me to come up with something like a down golem. But if you don't have that background, I could see stumbling a lot playing this. If you're a fan of these narrative style games where the players have a lot of input into the world around them and dig dungeon crawling tropes, you really should check out Runaway Hirelings. For a section-by-section -section review, a uh, section-by-section look at Runaway Hirelings, you can head over to tabletopbelltop.com and click on Reviews.